I shoot, other officers shoot. I just remember as soon as that knife started coming up and, and it's, it's kind of like super focused vision. All I saw was the tip of that knife coming directly at me. And literally in a blink of a second, I saw my life literally flashing before my eyes. This shooting was my tipping point. This is where my jar, it overflowed. It got too much. And for me, this was my breaking point. And so it wasn't just the shooting, but it was the hundreds and hundreds of incidents and the almost shootings that I was involved in up to this point. And it got to the point where literally, I didn't want to be here anymore. It was so bad that I literally wanted to die in the line of duty. I started purposely putting myself in dangerous situations, hoping a bad guy killed me at worst because my nightmares increase. I started to doubt myself, even though I know I saved lives, even though I know I had no choice. I started thinking, what if I would have paused here? What if I would have waited there? What, you know, magical thinking that wasn't realistic. But that's where I got to the point where really I wanted to die in the line of duty. And so all I could think about was my six-year-old daughter at the time. And what was going to be the effect on her if she found out that I killed myself or if I died in the line of duty? What's going to be the domino effect on her? On the anniversary of my shooting, 2016, December 27, 2016, I finally got the strength and courage to ask for help. And that is where everything changed for me. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my career was at the very beginning. Um, I told myself that I would never bring work home. I would never talk about the job with my family or loved ones. And by doing that, I created a, a barrier between my then spouse. You know, I ended up getting a divorce through this nightmare process. Um, I created a divide between us. But when I came home in a bad mood or pissed off, you know, my family was walking on eggshells because they didn't realize it was a horrific car accident or child death that I had to deal with that day. They thought it was them. You know, they thought, they thought I was just pissed off and in a bad mood. And, and so I didn't do the job of communicating, hey, you know, here's what happened today. Not in graphic detail, but enough to let them know that, hey, you know, I've been affected. I just need a little time to decompress, a little space, and then we can re-engage and we can talk about it. So that was the biggest mistake. But, you know, while I was suffering, literally I was losing everything. My health was failing. I lost my, my father, my hero. My marriage was over. I mean, you name it, it was going, right? And so during that time, I thought I was the only one. I thought there was nobody out there that would understand what I was going through. I thought people would judge me. I thought something was wrong with me. And I didn't realize until I started my recovery process that actually there's countless brothers and sisters out there who do get it, who do understand it. And I'm talking about not just law enforcement and military, but I'm talking about firefighters, paramedics, dispatchers. We all have to deal with these same horrific scenes. And so all these things are affecting us, but we don't talk about it. But I want people to know there's endless resources out there that will let you see that you're not alone, that these feelings you're having are actually normal. It's a normal reaction to all the abnormal things that we have to see and deal with. But I want people to know I'm living proof. As dark as it got for me, I'm living a whole new life now, a phenomenal life, a better life than I ever have. And I want people to know that it, it wasn't easy. It took a lot of work. There was good days and bad days. But I promise you and I assure you, if you take that hardest step and you raise your hand and ask for help, there will be people there to help you.